What's up everybody, Mr. J here, and this is the part two video covering the nephron and reabsorption. So today we are going to be going through the proximal convoluted tubule, what is reabsorbed there, as well as some clinical applications and how we can take the physiology of how we reabsorb different solutes and fluids and apply it to something like diabetes and its symptoms, as well as altitude sickness. So today, that's what we're gonna go through. Check out the next videos. We'll cover actually the descending and ascending loop of Henle, and then I'm gonna go into the distal convoluted tubule and its reabsorption and hormone regulation. So stick with me. Might be a little longer video, so hopefully this is helpful for something like nursing and those types of things if you're going through A&P. So let's get started. So first off, the nephron, once again, I covered in the last video, the overview, and it is the functional unit of the kidney. It's going to reabsorb different solutes and fluids back into the bloodstream so that we we can basically keep our bloodstream constant with different things like solutes, like sodium, glucose, amino acids, those types of things. So today, we're going to focus on this first part of the nephron. Again, this is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Why is it called the proximal convoluted tubule? Because it's closest proximal to Bowman's capsule, basically where the blood is being filtered into the tubule. It's closest and it's convoluted because it's kind of twisted and tubule because it's just a tube, right? So the goal today is to get stuff filtrate that's inside the tubule and reabsorb, bring back into the bloodstream different solutes like glucose, sodium, chloride, those types of things, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in on what's actually happening here at the proximal convoluted tubule. So I have this little diagram. Now don't get too confused, it's pretty straightforward. This middle part, okay, this is going to be what's called the lumen or the opening of the tubule, <clears throat> okay? So this tubule is going to basically contain the filtrate, the stuff that we've filtered out of the blood plasma that we're going to either reabsorb into the bloodstream or if it continues and it stays here the entire track, that's eventually going to end up as urine. Right, because if it passes through the proximal convoluted tubule, continues all the way through to the collecting duct, it's going to be excreted out as urine. So we're going to be really focusing on how can we get stuff from here, the tubule lumen, through the tubular cells and into the bloodstream, okay? So I said another couple things. So these guys, these are the tubular cells. These are going to be the ones that are going to actively pull solutes into themselves and then put them back into the bloodstream. And that's basically what we're going to be talking about. And then these would be the peritubular capillaries. Peritubular capillaries, what does that mean? Around the tubule, capillaries, tiny blood vessels that will have little holes in them, little slits, to allow things to pass into them very easily. Those are called fenestra, fenestrated windows, okay? So where is this at? All this black line that I have will be these cells. The red dotted lines will be these capillaries and we're trying to reabsorb things from the tubule lumen into the capillaries. So let's get started. First off, in order to pull things into the cells, things like sodium and glucose and those types of things, we need to establish some sort of driving force behind it all, okay? And you've probably heard of this one before, but we have in these cells a very common pump, okay? Both on the apical side, the side facing the lumen, as well as the basolateral side, okay? The bottom basically facing the capillaries. And these things are going to be little membrane proteins and they're going to be called sodium potassium pumps, okay? So both of these guys will be our sodium potassium pumps and there's going to be a ton of them on all of these cells, okay? Lining the cells. Now, what do the sodium potassium pumps do? Well, what they do is they establish what's called a concentration gradient, okay? A concentration gradient of sodium and potassium. So, using ATP, so we've got ATP that's going to be made here in a second, and that ATP is going to be used and turned into ADP plus a phosphate. You can look at my ATP video if you want to know about that process. But ATP is used and it fires so that we'll color potassium in orange. We're going to pump two potassium into the cell, and we're going to pump three sodium 
out of the cell. <clears throat> so three sodium is getting kicked out, two potassium is getting pumped in. Well, what does that do? Well, it makes the basically the capillaries as well as in the tubule themselves, because in reality it's going to be doing the same thing, three sodium out into the tubule, and then two potassium in <clears throat> using ATP. What that's going to do is it's going to make the inside of all these cells very high, keep this in mind, in potassium, and therefore very high or very low in sodium. And if you watch any of my videos, you know that the inside of the cell is going to have a lot of potassium, low sodium. On the outside of the cell, so in the lumen, we're going to have high amounts of sodium, and we're going to have low amounts of Potassium. This is probably the most important thing you need to realize, okay? Why? Because now we have something to play with. Because if you watch, again, any of my videos, I talk about things moving from high to low. And if you don't believe me, if you drop anything, it moves from high to low. Well, high to low also is uh, applied to concentrations. So how much something has in one space, okay? So for example, if we have high potassium inside the cell that's surrounded by a membrane, okay, a barrier, if we allow it, potassium wants to flow where? From high to low, right? So <clears throat> it can either move from high to low into the tubule or it could move high to low into the capillary. So in reality, both sides on the both apical and basal sides of this tubular cell is going to have low potassium and it's going to have a high amounts of sodium. Keep that in mind. Awesome, because now we can play with it. Now we can play with it. So check this out. <clears throat> There's going to be a ton of different proteins on this apical side of the tubular cells. And I'm just showing you on this one, I'm gonna show you a different process on this side, um, but just imagine that both sides have this going on, okay? It's just kind of mirrored, all right? So there's going to be several different membrane proteins to allow to bring things from the tubule into the bloodstream because that's the goal, reabsorption. There's going to be some, I'll just draw them like as circles, that are going to be called sodium, and I'm just going to put blank, symports. Sodium blank symports. Why do I put blank here? Because these are things like glucose, so sugars that give your cells basically the fuel to uh, make energy, amino acids, so the base unit of proteins that we need to build our cells and build our bodies, okay? So if, if you insert any of those things, like glucose, <clears throat> amino acids, the way they get into, or basically out of the tubule, into the tubular cells, is through these symports, okay? So what's happening here, let's take glucose for example. Sodium is in high concentrations out here, right? <clears throat> so if sodium is high out here, it wants to go into the cell, yes? At the same time, if you think about it, <clears throat> we're going to have plenty of glucose that's filtered out because this is basically plasma filtrate from your bloodstream and your bloodstream has glucose in it, right? So we're going to have a decent amount of glucose in the tubule immediately when it enters, okay? Because it's filtered up in the plasma, glucose levels, okay? So we're going to have glucose here too. So what will happen is, it's a sim port, which sim means kind of same. So sodium wants to move in, right? And if it's a sim port, the same direction, we're going to bring in glucose as well with it. Okay? So keep in mind, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of sodium blank sim ports that are using that concentration gradient of sodium to pull other things in with it. It's like, uh, think about if like you have a really high energy kid and there's this like revolving door at a hotel room and they're really excited to run into it. So they grab you and they run into the revolving door and they run inside the hotel, right? So sodium is a high energy kid pulling glucose you into the hotel or the cell, all right? So it's a sim port using that concentration gradient. Now, we've got glucose in here. Other things like amino acids can also pop in here as well. So, <clears throat> now, once glucose gets into the cell, we want to reabsorb it, right? Reabsorb means to bring back into the bloodstream. So, on this basal side, what we need to have, I'm gonna erase this quick. What we need to have on this side is an ability to, to get glucose, pretty big molecule, into the bloodstream. So, what do we need? Well, we need some sort <clears throat> 
of transport protein again. <clears throat> this guy will likely be what's called a glucose uniport. Well, what's a glucose uniport? Well, the name tells you, right? It's glucose basically traveling a one-way ticket one direction, right? Well, if we think about it, if we're reabsorbing a lot of glucose, okay, we're going to pack this cell with sugar, right? And yes, some of the sugar is going to be used up as fuel, and we'll talk about that here in a second. <clears throat> but that glucose, high concentration here, low-ish concentration in the capillaries, glucose will just passively diffuse through facilitated diffusion into the peritubular capillaries, okay? That's how we reabsorb glucose, yes? Awesome. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about glucose a little bit more because it's a very important, important molecule, both for cell respiration and as we talk about diabetes and its clinical connection. Okay, so first off, I told you that the first thing that started this whole process was the sodium potassium pump. It needed ATP to run, didn't it? Well, when we make ATP, how do we do that? Well, we combine glucose and we add six oxygen molecules and we will produce a lot of ATP, <clears throat> as well as, we'll talk about this later, CO2 and water, all right? So we're using some of that glucose as fuel to basically make ATP to run our sodium symports, but we're also helping it to be reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries, awesome. Now, <clears throat> let's think about this. Let's think about this in terms of glucose as a solute. And now I'm going to connect it to diabetes. Now, uh, if you've had anybody in your family that had been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, okay? So basically, you get it. it it's not your fault. You just got type 1 diabetes. Ask them what their first symptom was that told them, hey, something's wrong, okay? If you ask them which symptom they had, it would be that they are frequently urinating. They are peeing out so much fluid for no reason. It's not like they're drinking a lot of water or anything like that. They're just peeing a lot. So they go to the doctor and they realize, hey, you have type 1 diabetes. And usually when they test their urine, they have a massive amount of glucose in their urine. Why? Okay, let's think about this. <clears throat> so... First off, if you are diabetic, what will happen is your glucose levels in your bloodstream, so in your bloodstream coming into the nephron, will be very, very high in glucose. Because what happens when you're a diabetic is insulin is not being produced. And insulin is like the key that brings in glucose into the cells to be used for cell respiration. Okay, So if you don't have insulin, glucose stays in your bloodstream. So if glucose stays in your bloodstream, well, that means when you filter your blood into the kidneys, so into this filtrate, you're going to have very, very high amounts of glucose, an insanely high amount of glucose. So your proximal convoluted tubule will be like, holy crap, we've got a lot of glucose to reabsorb. So what happens is, is glucose starts being symported, brought back into the peritubular capillaries. Awesome. But here's the problem. Once it gets <clears throat> past this proximal convoluted tubule right there, when it starts going in the descending loop of Henle, there are no more sodium glucose symports. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, it means that this protein doesn't exist longer down the line of the nephron. If that protein doesn't exist, guess what? You can't bring back glucose into your bloodstream. That means that glucose stays in the tubule. That means that glucose is excreted as urine. Now, if you watched my previous video, I told you that water likes to stay where there's a lot of solute or dissolved stuff. Well, glucose is a solute, just like sodium, just like everything else, right? So if glucose is a solute and glucose is staying in the tubule, what also will stay in the tubule? A lot of water. So if water stays in the tubule because glucose is staying in the tubule, guess what? You're gonna pee out a lot of fluid, right? Because if something stays in the tube, it ends up as urine. So since glucose stays in here, lots of solute glucose, pulls water with it, peed out as urine. So now you have very watery urine with a lot of glucose coming out, all right? So that is the clinical application to 
diabetes. If you have questions on that, please comment and I'll be happy to help. Okay, awesome. So that's glucose, sodium potassium pump. Um, another thing that you may have on a test <clears throat> is talking about a reabsorbing salt, okay? And with salt, it's not just sodium. It's sodium chloride, right? So you also have these chlorine ions that are being reabsorbed as well, okay? So you may see that in my diagram and I'm like, oh, this has like 65% sodium chloride reabsorbed, right? Well, how does the chlorine come into it? Well, I'm glad you asked. On this basal side, there will also be other symports, okay? And these will be called potassium chlorine symports. Potassium chlorine symports. What does that mean? Well, you remember that potassium is really high inside the cell, right? So potassium is really high inside the cell. Well, guess what? <clears throat> if there's a symport, it will power the symport and bring potassium out into the bloodstream. What will follow? Chlorine. So chlorine will also get reabsorbed. So now we have chlorine being reabsorbed with sodium. So now that's like the sodium chloride. Now, what will happen to that potassium? Well, we are going to use that sodium potassium pump to just keep having high concentrations of potassium inside so we can keep it high inside the cell to power those types of symports. Awesome. So we'll stick with that for this bottom one with the clinical application for diabetes.